All right, so welcome everyone. Um, let me hit the record button here. And so uh, Sean brought up a question before some of you logged in about the homework and uh, had encountered a problem. And I've also heard from a, a, at least one other person that they were having difficulty with this too on problem 15. And I believe that's the problem where they're, they're asking you to compare the returns on a stock position versus that of an option position. And the, I, I think the problem lies in the situation that uh, they're, they're looking at the return over a period that is less than one year, but they're asking for an annualized return on that. So the normal way to annualize that return would be to take the periodic return, add one to it, raise it to the power of the number of periods per year. So in the case of the problem that I was looking at with uh, one of you earlier today, that would have been six months. And I don't know if the algorithm changes that periodicity or maybe they were all six months. So let's just assume it's six months. Um, that's two periods per year. So it'd be one plus the periodic rate, all raised to the second power, minus one. All right, and so that, I mean, essentially that looks like this. Um, where's my pencil? So if we have uh, five, 50% is our periodic rate. Uh, raised to the power of two, that's the number of periods per year if it's a six month investment, and then minus the one, and that gives us our annualized rate. So in this particular example, that would be uh, one plus 0.5 raised to the second power minus one equals, and so that should be. Um, 125%. So that comes out to be um, 1.25. Or when we multiply that by 100 to get it into percentages, that's uh, equal to 125% return, not just 100% return. Because when you're compounding, you're getting in that second period, you're getting 50% interest on the 50% that you received in the first six month period, right? So that's the typical way to do that. I think what the, the person who wrote the key to that problem was doing was just simply doing a simple interest. So they were saying, well, if it was 50% every six months, just multiply by two and that's 100% annually. That is incorrect. They made the opposite mistake in the problem where we had the call money rate. So I'm gonna reach out to, I know one of the authors personally, I'm gonna reach out to him and I'm also gonna reach out to the publisher and see if there isn't some way of fixing this problem um, because it's exactly backwards uh, to how we typically compute uh, annualized returns. And um, so if you ran into difficulties with that one, just like we did on the last one, I'm going to give you back credit for that problem. But I want to make sure, though, that you're all comfortable with what I just showed you now as the correct way, because that's the way that we'll be looking at it for the exam. Uh, any, any questions that you might have on this? Is this all kind of more correlated with what you were thinking when you did the problem? See a few heads. Yes, is that right? Okay, all right. Brett says yes. Others, rest of you are all okay with it. Okay, great, very good. Um, okay, so let's get back to. Um, well, it, it, let me just uh, add one one other thing. Um, I've been trying to keep up with when people are signing up to get into the Bloomberg terminal. Um, so I, I, I didn't check it this morning, but I did look at it yesterday and approved anyone who has uh, requested permission to log into the terminal. So I hope that you're getting in there. The one thing that I'm a little concerned about, I, I see that two people have started it, um, and that's it. So 
make sure that you get in there and use, maybe you've started it, but you didn't enter the class code, make sure that you enter that class code because that allows me to see how things are going and uh, make sure that everybody is moving along at the right pace. Remember, we're, I think I set the deadline at March 14th. Um, so, you know, don't wait till two days or even a week before. Get started on it now. Um, if you are entirely remote and can't get to campus, you'll have to use the remote access uh, on bba.bloomberg.net. And sometimes even getting that set up can be problematic. Um, you can certainly reach out to me if you have difficulty, but I also recommend that you look at the instructions on the, on the bba.bloomberg.net page, as well as you can call the Bloomberg number. There's an 800 number. You get a live person. It doesn't take but 30 seconds or a minute before you get somebody. And more likely than not, they'll be able to walk you through it. I can help more with a Mac um, than a PC. I, I don't live in the PC world anymore, thank goodness. Um, but uh, you know, either way, uh, that Citrix workspace is important that you have that installed. Uh, and even with that installed, occasionally you'll get errors. Um, sometimes it will simply be because somebody else is already in the terminal. That's also another reason why it's very important that you sign up for terminal time. And, in the, and again, yesterday I looked at the schedule, the calendar, no one signed up anywhere. So, uh, you know, make sure that you get in there. The homework is the stuff on Canvas that you're doing every Monday, but then there are these longer term projects uh, and you've got to get that, get it going as soon as you can. Um, if you are on campus, you can access the physical terminal itself, which is a little bit easier because you don't have those connectivity problems. Once you're in the terminal, usually it's not a big deal uh, when you're remote, but it's just getting your system set up. That's always the pain. But if you're on campus, we have a physical terminal. It's in the new data analytics lab down on the first floor in, in what used to be classroom 106. There's a little uh, uh, annex to that bigger room. And in the back of that room is where the Bloomberg terminal is. I haven't been in recently, but we used to have a, a two panel set up. And so um, it's, a, it's also a lot easier to work on it with uh, two big screens as opposed to uh, maybe your laptop or something like that. So uh, if you're on campus, go in. One, uh, also, one, one thing you should also note that I believe it's going to be next Monday and Tuesday um, that lab is going to be closed. In fact, Ian, I think you're, are, aren't you in the, uh, the data analytics lab right now? Oh, okay. That background kind of looks like you might've been in there, but, uh, in any case, um, on Monday and Tuesday, they are going to close it because they're putting in, uh, electronic, uh, door locks and they wanted the, the people doing the work to have, uh, plenty of social distancing and things of that nature. So the lab will be closed Monday and Tuesday of next week. So there's another 48 hours where we don't have access, or at least if the only, I should restate that, the only access you have is actually remote. All right, questions. Okay, let's, uh, let me back up here. Um, we were talking about growth rates. And so um, this, uh, let's see, we were looking at a couple of examples. And um, in the discussion of growth rates, we also talked about ROE decomposition. The ROE decomposition is an important element in, in this whole thing, uh, as well as it, it helps you to determine what the company is doing. It's also one of the inputs to the sustainable growth rate uh, estimate, um, but you can use it as kind of an investigative tool. So we, we uh, last week we ended by talking about that ROE is net income divided by equity, or it can be restated as Net income over sales times sales over assets times assets over equity. And the sales cancels the sales, the assets cancels the assets, 
and we're left with uh, net income over equity. So that is consistent with uh, what's to the left of ROE there. But the nice thing about breaking it up into these three individual ratios is that that first ratio is our profit margin. So it's a measure of profitability. That second ratio is asset turnover. So that's a measure of how efficiently are we utilizing the assets. And then the last ratio is a measure of financial leverage, which tells us how much debt versus how much equity are we using to support our asset base or pay for the asset base. And, and the reason that that's important outside of the discussion about growth rates in general is that when we start analyzing firms and comparing one firm to its peer group and uh, the, the competitors, if you will, um, it helps us to break down the ROE into these component pieces to see if there's something in particular that's driving ROE in the case of our subject firm versus the peer firms, right? So it might be that our, our subject firm is uh, very profitable, has very high margins, but is just mediocre in terms of managing its assets and, and has an average level of financial uh, leverage relative to its peers. Uh, or maybe it's very efficient in utilizing its asset base, but not terribly profitable. It doesn't have a very big margin. Uh, but remember, the important thing is we're comparing to our peer group and trying to ascertain what is it that our subject company is doing well and what might our subject company need to do better. And then remember, as an analyst, we're an analyst, not a consultant. So we can't actually walk into management and say, hey, we think you ought to do X, Y, and Z and make the company better. What we're doing is we're standing outside the company looking in as a, uh, a kind of uh, without trying to affect it at all. We're just looking at, is it operating well? And if we see an area where it's weak relative to its peers, then we want to look at whether management recognizes this and is management taking some steps or measures to ameliorate that problem as well, right? So remember, remember who we are when we get to this security analysis. We are analysts. We are not touching the firm. We're just standing outside the firm looking in and seeing how it's going and, and then trying to make some predictions about how well it will perform into the future. If management seems to be oblivious to some sort of profitability problem or some sort of efficiency problem, or maybe they have very low financial leverage relative to their peers, then that, then our, that, that will color our, our judgment about the future profitability and future viability of the firm uh, from an investor's perspective, right? So that's, that's the really important element here in this uh, ROE decomposition. This is also known as the DuPont analysis. Uh, so it goes by either ROE decomposition or DuPont analysis. All right, so back to um, looking at this um, uh, two-stage dividend discount model. We're still working on that piece of it. We didn't quite get to this at the end of last week, so this, is, this should be new material to you all, or at least uh, material that we haven't talked about in lecture. You've read about it. The two-stage is a much more realistic model uh, when we're looking at dividend discount uh, model in general. And what that does is it allows us to value firms that have some sort of super normal growth for a short period of time and then revert back to a lower level of growth. It also allows us to value firms that might have negative uh, growth in the near term. So a situation like we're in right now, uh, think about the restaurant industry. Um, their, their sales have declined, many of them have, and um, so, but we expect that to change in the future. So it also allows us to accommodate some sort of short-term negative growth and then reverting back upward to a long-run uh, growth rate. Uh, so G1 is that short-term period, and G2 is the long-term period. Uh, capital T here uh, and I apologize, this bracket is misplaced. I should have put it outside of there. So that's how it should be. 
So these two capital T's are the period of supernormal or um, lower than normal growth that we're trying to model. Um, and you'll see here again, G1 is up here, G1 here, uh, G1 in here. And then K, of course, is our discount rate, our required rate of return that shareholders require of this firm. D sub zero is the dividend that just occurred. So we're looking back to one day ago or one period ago, whatever that dividend is. Um, and then we're growing it at uh, either G1 or G2. Now, I'm not going to go into deriving this. I don't think that's a particularly useful way to spend our time. But I do want you to think about just the overall uh, look of this thing. Think, Kind of break it into two pieces, if you will. Um, this first piece right here, these, this term, um, if we break that up into two things, what we see is we've got this, which is looks just like the constant perpetual growth. Oops, constant perpetual growth. So that's the, the dividend discount model that we looked at last week. So that's simply the most recent dividend grown at the growth rate divided by K minus G1. So that assumes that growth rate forever into the future. Now the second half of, the, of that first term though, what that does is that basically says, oh, wait a minute, we're not going to grow at that rate for the entire, uh, out to forever. We're only gonna grow at that rate for T periods. So that thing in the brackets actually subtracts out anything beyond period T. And so this first term gives us the value of that T periods of dividends. The second term down here gives us from T on out to infinity. And that's growing at this G2 rate. And again, you can see that this right here also looks like that constant perpetual growth model. And we're starting actually at D0 uh, growing at G2 at that long-term rate. Uh, we're still dividing by K minus G2 here. So that's, that's basically saying, hey, let's start at time zero. What's the value of the firm that grows at G2 till forever? And then this part of the formula, or this part of the term rather, subtracts off the first T periods of that value. So if you just think about it in an intuitive sense like that, this rather ugly formula as it is, uh, hopefully be becomes a bit more approachable. But this is a very useful formula, one that you'll probably use in your security analysis. Um, let's see here. Uh, we can value both, as I mentioned, we can value both uh, a negative uh, growth rate in the near term as well as a super normal growth rate. And so there are some examples of that. So if we had a, a negative, in this particular case, we had a short-term growth of negative 10%, and then it reverts back to uh, a G2 of 4%. Uh, the two-stage model can manage this. Uh, we're also assuming here that we have a, a K of 10%. And so when you plug that in, so here is the, uh, the value of the firm for that T periods of negative growth. And here's the value of the firm discounted back to today for the uh, for the, uh, beyond period T. And add those two together and we get a value of the firm of $46.03. Um, there were some questions about, ooh, wait a minute, that is the wrong, oh no, ah, all right, um, my, uh, my slides did not update, I, uh, I fixed this H model, let me come back to the H model, this is an incorrect formula, um, I've got the correct formula, but for some reason my Dropbox didn't update my, uh, my iPad, so, um, let me come back and revisit that. There were some questions about this. This H model, I'll, I'll give you just the brief intro to it, though. 
uh, the H model basically says, um, you know, it's it, what we were doing before uh, when we had a two stage in the two stage model, we would say have a, let's say we have a super normal growth rate of 30%. And then after a period of time, so this is T periods, it drops down to say 10%. Well, that's not usually how growth rates operate. They're not step functions. They don't just all of a sudden go from 30 to 10. So this H model, what it does is it says, well, let's assume that there's some sort of linear transition here uh, between the supernormal rate and the, and the long run rate, and let's make it go like that. And that's the essence of what this H model is doing, is it's, is it's trending downward. And you can do various variations on that. Um, I'll come back to that on Thursday and fill in that blank. I apologize for that bad slide, but uh, it didn't get, uh, didn't get uploaded. All right, um, discount rates. That's something we haven't talked about yet. You've touched on it in 3.12. Uh, you may have seen some further discussion in other classes, but this is really uh, coming out of the CAPM. We'll dig, we'll do a deeper dive, we'll dig further into this in later chapters after the midterm. But what I want you to uh, be able to just understand at this point is that K comes out of the CAPM, and the essence of it is that we're taking the risk free rate, which is usually proxied for by the T bill rate except in periods like today, when the T-bill rate is nearly zero. Remember, what we're really trying to do is project out long into the future. And so when we have short-term T-bill rates, or when we have current, rather, uh, T-bill rates that are near or at zero, we know that's not going to stay that way, or at least we don't expect it to. So uh, today, it's a little more difficult to figure out what that risk-free rate should be. Uh, what you could do is just take an average over the past 20 years uh, to proxy as the risk-free. And then to that risk-free rate, because remember, it says it's risk-free, but we're dealing with a risky asset. We're going to add some sort of adjustment uh, that increases the required rate of return to account for the level of risk that we're taking on. And that level of risk that we're taking on is measured by what we call the stock's beta. And that comes, again, out of Cap M and more details on that when we get to that chapter. And so we're going to take that stock beta, and we're going to multiply it by the stock market risk premium. Otherwise, uh, you know, it might even shorten it up, just MRP, market risk premium. So it's the beta times the market risk premium tells us how much extra return we get for taking on risk. We add that to the return that we should get for the risk-free rate, and once we do that, then we have our discount rate, or also known as the required rate of return, also known as K. Okay. Any questions on how to get K? I mean, because right now we're just looking at the mechanics of it, not uh, the theor theory behind it. Everybody okay with that? All right, great. Okay, so uh, just to kind of wrap up on the dividend discount model and then transition into talking about the residual income model and then eventually relative evaluation, um, just the kind of the summary of what's good about the constant perpetual growth model, it's very simple to compute. Um, what's bad about it, it doesn't work for firms that don't pay dividends. It's not usable when the growth rate is higher than K. Now, there's one exception, right? If we use a two-stage, uh, we can get around that if we have a short-term growth rate that is higher than K. Um, but in the constant perpetual version of the model, the very simple version of it, if G is greater than K, we can't use the model. It doesn't mean that we can't value the firm. It simply means we can't use this model to value that firm. Uh, it's also very sensitive to the choice of G and K. 
meaning in particular that as G and K get close to one another, in other words, uh, K still has to be greater than G, but if K and G are relatively close, that makes the denominator smaller and smaller, and any time you divide by a very small number, you get a very big number as a result. And so the, oftentimes this can cause the, the firm value to blow up. Um, this uh, this uh, second to last point is true of virtually every model that we're going to look at, but still merits uh, pointing out that K and G are very difficult to compute. I've shown you some mechanical ways to compute it, but in the real world, we don't know what the heck it is. We, we don't even know if Cap M is the right model. Um, DGP is a word that gets uh, uh, discussed by the, the quants on Wall Street. That's the data generating process. We don't know what the data generating process is. We don't know what the, D D the DGP is. Um, there's a lot of evidence that CAPM is a good start at understanding the DGP, but I think I mentioned this uh, last week, there are multiple other models, uh, not the least of which is the Fama French three-factor model. That's one of the most famous and most widely used on Wall Street, uh, which adds two more betas, if you will. And then there are models that go up to at least seven factors uh, to date. And the authors of those models claim that all seven factors are a valuable addition. So this is six factors beyond the beta that uh, you've been you've learned about in 312. So K can be very difficult to estimate, even on a historical basis. Um, G can also be very difficult to estimate because you're you're looking out into the future. Um, and then cost perpetual growth is often an unrealistic assumption. Well, yeah, I mean that's Again, we're, we're going for back of the envelope, simple, quick and dirty uh, when we look at something like the constant perpetual growth model. When we uh, add to the uh, model, make it a two-stage model, then we have more realistic assumptions about the growth of the firm. It's closer to reality. Um, usable when G is greater than K in the first stage or when G is negative in the first stage. Um, not usable, again, still for firms that don't pay dividends, obviously. And it is still sensitive to the choice of G and K, just like in the uh, constant perpetual growth model. And again, K and G are, are difficult to estimate. One other thing that I wanted to bring up to you, and hopefully this video will, will work in this case. I checked it uh, this morning and it was running. We'll, we'll see if the technical difficulties work through here and whether you can hear the audio. But... Um, the other thing that I want to point out about and any model, this goes for any model, is that any point estimate is almost always going to be wrong. Maybe only by pennies, but maybe by a few dollars, maybe by many dollars. And we don't know how much that is unless we do some sort of sensitivity analysis. And in the old days, you could do a you know, a base case, a best case, and a worst case scenario, and you'd call it good. Today, we've got so many tools available to us. We don't need to be that rough with our sensitivity analysis. We can actually get pretty specific. Uh, and one of the things that I've found to be useful, I've used this in the past, is uh, a, a product uh, called At Risk, produced by the Palisades company. It's a plug-in to Excel. Unfortunately, it doesn't work on Macs, so I haven't used it lately. I can't demonstrate it, but I did want to show you this brief video. I apologize for the, the music is a bit dated. It's, I think the video is from 2008, but uh, take a look at this. This is kind of a cool way of getting away from that problem of having only a point estimate. Let's see if this works. Welcome to At Risk, the risk analysis add-in for Microsoft Excel. Are you Excel. guys hearing audio? At Risk uses Monte Carlo simulation Great. to show virtually all the possible outcomes in any situation it, where there's uncertainty. Here is a simple financial spreadsheet representing a hypothetical product launch. Some values, such as number of competitors, the unit cost, and the sales volume are uncertain. At Risk lets you represent the uncertainty with a range of values called a probability distribution function. Add a distribution to the value for unit cost using the Define Distribution window. 
at risk distribution. So it, let me just jump in here. Um, for some reason, I don't have audio, but uh, as long as you do, that's the important part. It, 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 what they're talking about here is you're going to what I would call parameterize uh, this uh, input. So the one of the inputs in this is cost. And uh, so you're going to put some estimation of the distribution of that cost. Because we know, again, cost is not going to be a point. Our point estimate of cost is almost always going to be wrong. But if we parameterize it and put a distribution around some estimate of cost, then we are more likely to capture the actual cost, the realized cost, the one that shows up. So what they're going to do is they're going to use a normal distribution, but you can see uh, you, you have the choice of using a variety of distributions. You can even plug in a histogram that you've built up from historical data uh, of, of the company that you might be analyzing. Previewing and data fitting features make it easy to assign the correct distribution to any uncertain value in your model. Choose a normal distribution to describe unit cost. Next, choose the bottom line cell whose values we are interested in, in this case the net present value of the product launch. Click the Add Output button to make at risk track this result. And again, let me jump in here. Uh, so just to fill in some of the blanks that they didn't mention, um, that unit cost is part of this spreadsheet and there's a formula that leads to the value that they're generating up in that top cell that they just uh, highlighted as the output cell. So that cost has an effect on the output cell. So what they're gonna do is they're going to take the distribution around that cost estimate and they're going to reach into that distribution and draw a value out. And then they're gonna plug that into the spreadsheet and let the formula calculate a value that's going to show up in that top cell that they just defined as the output cell. And they're going to record that value. Then they're going to reach into the distribution again, pull out another value randomly, plug it in. The formula is going to do its thing, calculate a profit. They're going to record that profit. And they're going to do that another 998 times. And you'll see the distribution that gets generated here in just a second. Now click Simulate to run the simulation. Watch as so at risk uses Monte Carlo, Monte Carlo simulation to sample the values from the probability distribution functions in your model over and over. For each iteration or recalculation of the model, at risk records the new resulting net present value. This simulation ran for 1,000 iterations, giving us a look at 1,000 different scenarios. This histogram shows those 1,000 outcomes and the likelihood of each occurring. Now let's look at a cumulative curve of the same data. We can see there is only about a 5% chance of net present value exceeding $1 million. If $1 million were our target for launching the product, the project would be canceled. And so you can see with this, you know, what, what you could say to the your boss if you're presenting them with this data is that there's a 95 or approximately 95% chance that the MPV of this project is going to be between just a shade above zero up to 1 million. All right. And there you're not just providing a point estimate of, say, it's going to be 0.536 million. You're giving them a range and you're giving them some sort of assessment of the probability of falling within that range. And this is based upon probably some sort of judgment, but also you might be using the historical data to come up with the distribution of the costs that you might be facing here. So this is this is a really valuable um addition to your toolkit. So you might look into something like this. There's another product called uh, Crystal Ball that does a similar type of thing, but uh, those are the primary two competing products that I know of that are Excel plugins. And like I said, I wasn't able to find one uh, that would plug into a Mac. So I don't know if you use Parallels, you can always uh, create a virtual Windows machine and, and run something like this or 
borrow somebody's PC. Anyway, um, let me get out of that, get back to the PowerPoint. Okay, so uh, before I go any further on that, any questions about the dividend discount model? I'll come back and review the H model on Thursday when I fix that formula, but anything else? Everybody could do this. All right, very good. So now we'll move into the residual income model. The residual income model and the dividend discount model mathematically and from a theoretical basis are the same thing. So what, what happens though with the residual income model is that it allows us to value a firm that does not pay a dividend. That's the key value of this model. Um, so it, it depends upon this thing called the clean surplus relationship. Those of you in accounting are probably familiar with that. So the clean surplus relation, um, and by the way, that should simply be relation. Relationships are something people have. A relation is something between two numbers or theories or values or something. Um, the change in book value. So this is delta book book value. Where did my pencil go? Come on. Delta book value. Oh, darn it. Why is that not working? All right. Well, forget about that. Won't be writing. Maybe? No. Uh, anyway, delta book value is equal to earnings per share minus dividends. Pretty simple idea, right? Straight out of the balance sheet. Now, um, oops. There we go. Uh, residual income model uh, goes by a variety of names. Um, another one that you may have heard of is uh, this idea of economic value added. And both of these ideas harken back to this idea that uh, in economics, if you earn what you should earn for the rest for the riskiness of that particular endeavor, you have zero economic profits. In other words, you're getting what you should get for that particular level of risk. However, if you have a positive economic profit, that means you're actually earning more than you should get for that level of risk. That's this idea of economic value added. That's also the residual income. That's the income left over above and beyond what you should be getting anyway given the level of risk. So um, those two concepts are identical as well. So if you've heard of EVA, this is basically EVA. Um, as far as inputs go, uh, we simply need the earnings per share that just occurred. We need the book value uh, most recently. We need, again, a K, uh, that is the required rate of return. And we also need some estimate of G and um, I apologize, I've also got to add in, didn't get those added into the uh, model here. So price is equal to book value plus EPS zero times one plus G minus B sub zero times K all divided by K minus G. So some of this might look familiar to the, uh, you know, in terms of the, uh, the dividend discount model. And there's good reason for that. So let's start off with the denominator here. Um, so this K minus G looks very familiar uh, to the, uh, or similar to the constant perpetual growth version of the dividend discount model. And that's because it is. So we're assuming this goes on forever. And so this is the closed form solution to an infinite sum. Um, so that's, that's getting us that, uh, the value uh, out to infinity. This numerator is interesting too. So here, this first term looks a lot like the dividend discount model in that uh, the EPS zero was just uh, the dividend at time zero in the dividend discount model. We're growing it at the G rate. 
Um, so that looks very similar. The other part of this, we're subtracting off, and note that it's important that we look at the mathematical operations. Uh, so multiplication always comes before subtraction. We could put brackets or parentheses around this just to help emphasize that. So what I'm subtracting from that EPS is what I should be getting anyway on my book value. So my required rate of return is K. I have a book value of equity of B sub zero. So K times B sub zero is the return I should get. That's, the, that, that's what I should already be getting. And so this numerator, when I put these two things together, if this is positive, that positive value is that residual income. It's the income above and beyond what I should be getting out of this, uh, given the level of risk that I'm taking. So I'm taking those residual incomes from here out to infinity, and I'm getting a present value on those things. Um, and, and again, it's closed form solution of an infinite sum. And then I'm adding that to this first term, which is simply the book value of equity, which is what I originally sold the equity for to begin with. All right, so that's the intuition behind the residual income model. It's not very complicated. Um, this is just another version of it. We've just done a little bit of algebra here. It's not nearly as intuitive, in my view, as this, as this first uh, version of the, uh, of the formula, of the relation. But it's simpler to calculate. Um, so you might actually use this to calculate your values, but if you're wanting to go back and think about the intuition behind it, uh, this version of the formula is much more intuitive, at least in my view. Questions about that? Everybody's okay? All right. So um, I'm not going to go through the details of an example, but basically, you know, here we're just, we, we've got some earnings that we just uh, received, $1.20. Um, in this case, we're being told that there are no dividends. Uh, book value of equity just was uh, found, and that, again, that's on a per share basis. $5.88.6, uh, uh, estimated growth rate of 9%, a K of 13%, plug and chug. And we end up with a, uh, a firm value of $19.46. Um, another thing that we can do here is to, let me plug in the numbers here, or the, or the operations rather. So, Another thing we can do with this formula, and we can also do this with the dividend discount model, is that instead of solving for a price, given a K, a G, and a dividend, or an earnings, and a book value of equity, we can actually solve for one of the things on the right-hand side. And people will often do this, is uh, you take the market price... And in this case, they're saying, well, why don't we take $10.94? Maybe that's the market price. And let's solve for the implied growth rate. So we're going to still use that same K, and we're going to use the same earnings, obviously, and the same book value of equity. But we're going to be solving for this G. Actually, G turns out to be in two places. So just do a little bit of algebra, and again... Uh, the slides that I uploaded are going to have all the operations in here. I apologize. I didn't get these all put in for you. Um, my iPad is just terrible at translating that. But end of the end of the day, we solve and we get that it, there's an implied growth rate of 3.5%. So this can be really useful, particularly when we're in situations where there might be a bubble in the market. Uh, and I, the, one of the most clear-cut cases uh, that where people use this sort of uh, concept was in the, uh, the dot-com bubble back in the late 90s. So they would take the market price of companies that were being traded, and they would plug it into a formula like this. We know what the earnings were. We know what the book value of equity is. We can estimate a K. And they would solve for a G, and they'd get implied growth rates of double digits. 
and even into triple digits. And when you think about that, remember this formula says we are growing at that rate forever, forever. So if I get a growth, an implied growth rate of 25% on a company, that's 25% every year from now till the end of that company. That's a really high rate. And in fact, it's going to be huge by the time it gets out there. It's going to, it's going to subsume the economy as a whole, right? Because the economy only grows at 3% on average. So it, there, what it does is it allows to people to kind of think about how ridiculous some of the valuations were uh, when you have implied growth rates that are double digits and, and pushing up into triple digits. It's just absurd. Um, but it's another way to kind of uh, give yourself a, a bit of a gut check on, hey, is this a reasonable price or am I making some crazy assumptions here? Another thing that we often do instead of using dividends or earnings, dividends are the choice of management. Earnings are manipulated by accounting uh, practices and by accountants themselves. And there are some things that even everybody agrees with uh, that accounting uh, practices do, which is things like deducting depreciation that don't necessarily always make sense in a financial context. So there's another concept that we will often use, and that is instead of using dividends or earnings, we could use free cash flow. And the the book is typically talking about free cash flow to the firm. So it's actually FCFF, free cash flow to the firm. And I, I underlined that several times because it's not just to equity, it's to all firm stakeholders. So we have to take that into account when we're actually wanting to just value the equity. We've got to subtract off the value that uh, belongs to the debt holders. But the idea here is that even a company with negative earnings might have a positive cash flow. That's why it has a positive price. Um, so it, it, it's very important that we, we consider this from actually from a finance perspective. This is actually the most, what I would term, parsimonious with financial theory. It is the most correct, and I put correct in parentheses because not a lot of people use this method. It's easier to pull income off of the income statement, right? It's easier to look at what the dividends were reported and, and use that number. Here, I've actually got to do more calculations, but indeed, I actually get a more correct estimate of the value. It's not manipulated by various conventions that we use in accounting. So to get free cash flow to, a fir to the firm, uh, we need some sort of formula. We can start off with EBIT times one minus the tax rate. And then we're going to add back to it non-cash expenses. And the one that usually is the suspect here is depreciation. Remember, depreciation is not a actual cash flow. It's the cash flow on that actually occurred back when we bought the item. But accounting convention says we should spread that out over time. In fact, a matter, our actual cash flow is not impacted by depreciation. So we have to add that back in, even though that gets subtracted out in the income statement. The other thing that is not uh, um, directly reflected in the income statement are capital expenditures. So what's otherwise known as CapEx. You'll hear it referred to as that. So we're buying assets. And that doesn't show up when we look at something like net income either. So we, we need to subtract that off. That's an actual cash flow. We're actually paying out of pocket. And then the final thing here that gets subtracted from EBIT uh, after tax is change in networking capital. And again, that's a actual cash expenditure. So if we're taking on a new project, we usually have some sort of CapEx. 
and we usually also have some sort of change in networking capital. And that is because we're, we're taking on more, uh, more spending in the form of new equipment, new projects, and that means that we're probably going to have to fund the uh, short-term mismatch between uh, short-term assets and short-term liabilities uh, with some additional capital as well. Uh, mainly because related to things like accounts receivable, inventory, and accounts payable, right? That's th Those are the primary things that go into determining what our networking capital is. And if we're taking on a new project, probably networking capital is going to go up. Because networking capital, anybody remember the formula? What is it? I just said it, but... Anybody? My cat's telling me something, but I don't know if you can hear the cat in the background. I think she's wrong. Current assets minus current liabilities. Right, right. Current assets minus current liabilities. So that's where our accounts receivable. Thank you, Brent. Uh, that's where our accounts receivable and the inventory reside. The current assets and the current liabilities is where the, uh, the accounts payable reside. So we subtract that off. And then we end up with this thing that we call free cash flow to the firm. And I emphasize, I'm emphasizing that last F, which represents to the firm, because I want you to remember that's not the value to equity or the free cash flow to equity. That's the free cash flow to both equity and the debt holders. Uh, we can have earnings that are negative, but still have a positive free cash flow and vice versa, actually. We can have earnings that appear to be positive, and a negative cash flow. Here's an example that they go through. They say, let's look at two companies that are otherwise similar. They're simply depreciating an asset in a different fashion. So we've got uh, Twiddle D and Twiddle Dumb, uh, revenues both of 5,000, expenses, cash expenses both of negative, or of 3,000. Uh, so they have a cash flow that is identical. However, if they're depreciating that asset in two different ways, one here being straight line, right? So we just simply take the, uh, uh, the value of the asset and divide it over um, the three years of its life. And the other over here, Twiddledum, is using an accelerated depreciation schedule. And if we have a choice, of course, we're always going to choose the accelerated because that gives us a deduction to our income, which reduces our taxes sooner rather than later. Even though the total tax burden is going to be the same, the present value of that tax burden is lower. So uh, typically companies will choose this sort of method. But here's, here's what happens is that the net income of the company that chose straight line is constant, whereas the net income of the company that chose the accelerated depreciation method actually is lower early on and uh, increases as the depreciation uh, expense decreases in the uh, third year, in the second and third year. However, you'll note that the cash flows for each firm are identical. So that's the, that, that demonstrates the real importance of using free cash flow as opposed to using something like earnings. Uh, so even the residual income model, which benefits us in allowing us to value not only a firm that pays a dividend, but also a firm that doesn't pay dividends, uh, still is flawed in that it is using earnings rather than free cash flow as, as the measure of, of value. Um, and I think all of that is just restated right here. Um, one last thing that I haven't mentioned, though, and that relates to, again, that this is free cash flow to the firm, and that is that when we calculate the required return, we can't use the stock beta. We can't use the equity beta because we're not looking at the volatility that's just embedded in the equity or the stock. We're looking at the volatility of the underlying asset base, which includes assets that are funded by debt. So what we have to do here, and again, I apologize for not having these 
fixed um, just want to make sure I get the operations in there correctly so there th there's the formula to take a we can start with a equity beta but then we can back our way into an asset beta um, so typically this is this is a value that we can calculate using the uh, using the capital uh, the capital asset pricing model cap M um, and then we adjust it based upon the amount of leverage and our tax rate and we can actually uh, so so while this formula is stated uh, calculating an equity beta we could actually isolate the asset beta on the left hand side and that's really the thing that we'd be calculating is that asset beta because we don't actually have a way of valuing those assets um, uh, because they're on the books we don't know what their value changes are but we do see the stock value changing and therefore we can actually calculate a stock beta we know what the level of debt is we know what the level of equity is we know what the tax rate is and therefore we can then use that to calculate this uh, this asset beta and that is the beta that we discount these free cash flows at is this asset beta all right and then we get a value and then we subtract off of that value the value of the debt and that leaves us so we get some sort of uh, value based upon free cash flow to the firm and that's equal to the value of the debt plus the value of the equity so if we're wanting to get the value of the equity by itself then we just take the value from the free cash flow model of the firm minus the value of the debt and that gives us what we're after where do we get this well we go to the market and we look at the market value of debt we don't we we don't typically want to use book value of debt here we're always looking for market value of whatever asset it is or security that we're trying to value so we would just go to uh, to the uh, market for that sort of uh, level of debt in fact the actual debt we would look at its value add them all up various various bond issues that they've got add them all up subtract that from the value that we generate by using this free cash flow model to the firm okay So that gets us to uh, the end of talking about what I call fundamental valuation techniques, um, or at least the various models related to fundamental valuation techniques. DCF, or discounted cash flows, th these all are models that relate back to what we call DCF. Now, there's a very long-form version of DCF that we're going to look at in more detail in Chapter 19. So Chapter 19 really gets into um, that sort of thing. And, and you're going to do some sort of pro forma financial statements. You're going to estimate the cash flow at the end of each period. And then you're going to discount all those cash flows back to today. And that's kind of the the ultimate version of these fundamental valuation techniques but that's next week in chapter 19. how many of you have already dealt with um, f uh, pro forma financial statements do you know what those are no anybody had 310 yet ac 310 no or matt did you have it did i see you nodding yes oh okay all right, so it, they'll talk more about that, but chapter 19 kind of gives you a brief overview. A pro forma financial statement is a financial statement that we are projecting out into the future. So we're going to take what we've seen historically up to right now, and then we're going to make some assumptions about what the company is going to look like in the future, how revenues are going to grow, how costs are going to grow, things of that nature. And then we're going to create 
a a fake uh, or a projected rather not even not fake is not the right word but projected financial statements for next year the year after that we might even go out as far as 10 years out and uh, so we'll create all of these financial statements we'll have in particular most important one is probably our income statement but certainly the balance sheet and the statement of cash flows are are non-trivial as well we'll actually have uh, all three of those in a full-blown DCF model. At the end of the day, we calculate that free cash flow, and then we discount it back to today. We add it all up, and um, we end up with the value of the of the firm uh, based upon the free cash flow estimates that we've made using the pro forma financial statements. And then we subtract off the value of the debt, and we're left with the value of the equity. But that's that's described in more detail in your next week's reading. Um, so now we move into another realm of valuation called relative valuation. Now, even though I make a distinction between the two, the differences from a theoretical perspective should be zero. It's not always the case, though. Uh, so relative valuation is using some sort of ratio. P-E ratios get used very frequently, but there are a variety of other ratios that get used. Um, relative valuations are extremely popular when you, when you listen to the business press. Um, they're very good at determining the value of one stock against another. So you might be looking at two stocks in the same industry or sub-industry, which one is worth more relative to the other, or which one do I buy relative to the other? They cannot compare very well uh, the value across different asset classes. And they cannot uh, uh, value um, uh, whether the market is overvalued today or not. That's more of a fundamental valuation. Fundamental says this is what it's worth for a long term. Whereas relative says, well, given market conditions now, this is what this thing is worth. Um, so I, if, you're, if you're familiar with economic terms of equilibrium, so a full equilibrium would be more like the fundamentals. A uh, partial equilibrium model is more like this relative valuation model. It's say, basically it's saying if the market is misvalued, I'm still comparing what I'm valuing using the relative metrics to this overvalued or undervalued market. But I can't tell you, is it overvalued or undervalued? I'm saying it's right relative to other things around it. And maybe everything is overvalued. Maybe everything is undervalued. But I can't tell you that. The only way I can actually answer that question is going back to some sort of fundamental valuation. And even there... As I mentioned earlier, the DGP raises its head and says, well, you know what? We don't really know the data generating process underlying this. We're estimating it. So even that's estimated with error. There's a great debate that goes on in the finance world over this sort of thing. Um, but it's a little too deep. I just want you to have some knowledge of that. I don't want you to think that this is, you know, plug and chug. And, hey, we know exactly what this thing is worth. <laughs> Far from it. All right. Um, what kind of relative valuation? It, it can tell you, I want to buy a tech stock. Which one do I buy? Um, and which one of these IPOs is the best to buy? So, again, it, it's relative to something else. Uh, I can't tell you whether the market is overvalued or undervalued, though. So here are some of the various ratios that get used. So the, the classic P-E ratio, and there are even some variations on that, the PEG and the PEGI. Um, the, we also have value ver versus EBIT, value versus EBITDA, value versus cash flows, enterprise value versus EBITDA. And we'll talk about each of those uh, a little bit in turn. Um, uh, book values. So we're comparing the market price to the book uh, to the book price or the book value, and then uh, things that look at revenue per share or uh, enterprise value uh, per sales. 
And then there are some industry-specific ones. So price per kilowatt, price per ton, um, price per click in the, uh, in the internet world, or even uh, price per square foot if you're in the retail brick and mortar world. So there are a variety of specialty ratios that get used when we talk about relative valuation. I, I like to use this as an analogy because I think now maybe uh, I'm sure most of you have never bought a house, but maybe you've watched your parents buy a house. Um, they use relative valuation for the most part when we value a piece of residential property. Commercial property is a little different because there we can look at income and we can look at that as the as as the uh, as the measure. Um, but here, when we're talking about residential property, it's typically not rented, so we don't really have an income flow. Um, it, we don't know the value to replace it, or it's not even an accurate thing to capture. You look at the houses around John Carroll, um, you know, some of them were built in the 50s, some of them were built in the early 1900s, a few even before that. Very different building techniques. If I were to replicate uh, some of the houses here in Shaker Heights, where I live, and try to build them today, they would be extraordinarily expensive. You know, slate roofs, you know, stone fascia that's full stone instead of just some thin veneer, that sort of thing. So I could never value it based on that because what's, what's the functionality of a house anyway? I mean, I want to keep the snow out. I want to keep the cold out. I want to keep the rain off of me. I want to, uh, I want to make sure that I'm protected from you know, anybody entering the property, that sort of thing. That's really the, what's behind a house. It doesn't matter whether it's built out of uh, you know, quarried stone with a slate roof or whether it's an asphalt shingle roof. Um, so we end up, at the end of the day, we end up using some sort of relative valuation. So we're going to value a particular subject property relative to some other properties that are nearby. And so here, the, the example here is we have five different houses, A, B, C, D, and E. We have an actual sales price for each of those houses. And we also know the square footage of each of those houses. And therefore, we can get a price per square foot that was paid for those houses. And so house A, $110,000 for a 1,700 square foot house was $64.71 per square foot. House B, a little bit higher at $69.57, but you get the idea, we add those up, divide by five, and we get a average price per square foot of $65.51. Then we take that average price per square foot times the square footage of our subject property, and we end up with a uh, estimated value of that subject property of just a shade over $108,000. Now, there are many problems with this, um, not, uh, not the least of which, sorry about that, uh, not the least of which is that, how do I know that all five of these houses are identical? to my subject house? And the answer is, well, I've got to go inspect them. I've got to look at them. Better to look at them inside, too. I mean, again, back in the financial crisis, they were doing drive-by evaluations. So somebody would have these five properties just sold, and they would get in their car, they'd drive by them, look at the house, and go, yeah, its condition is about A, Minus, um, you know, it's sort of like this other house. They knew some of the particulars, how many bedrooms, how many bathrooms. But they didn't know what it really looked like inside. Uh, so they didn't have a very good estimate. I mean, were they gold-plated fixtures or were they the cheapest contractor uh, fixtures off the shelf at Home Depot that they could find? You know, uh, was, it, was there crown molding? Was there fancy plaster work? Um, Was there a lot of tile or a lot of carpeting? Some of the differences there. You have to account for these things because that could drive this sales price, right? We see that this house right here looks like it was the highest price per square foot. But maybe, maybe the reason that it was higher was that it actually had some interior components that were valued more highly by the buyer of that house. 
and maybe by buyers in general. So my, my point here is not to belabor the housing market and some of the in- intricacies of that, but to point out that the same holds true of companies. I need to really understand the the inner workings of a company. I can't just do a drive-by valuation and go, well, there's the PE of this company and there's the PE of that company. I'm going to assume they're all the same. I'm going to use the average PE to value my subject company. Wrong. You will get the wrong answer every time. Uh, So you've got to know what's inside these houses. You've got to walk through them. You've got to look at what generates value. You've got to know does does the market value crown molding or does it value you know wallpaper over paint or hard flooring over carpeting you've also got to know that sort of thing uh, and the the corollaries thereof for a particular company so this is but this gives you an example of how a relative valuation is done um, some other things to keep in mind here We've got to use these multiples intelligently. Um, Know what the fundamentals are uh, that determine the multiple. And by that, what we mean is price over earnings. That's the price of equity over the earnings of equity on a per share basis. So those are consistent in that the numerator is the price of equity and the denominator is the cash flow or the earnings that accounting accountants estimate that accrue to equity. It's not as though we've got um, price of equity over revenue, right? Revenue accrues to a whole bunch of different people before what's left over in earnings actually accrues to equity. So that could be more problematic. Um, we also need to know what sort of uh, growth implications, what sort of estimated required rate of return is embedded in that? And I'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, oh, actually, I see I've only got a minute left. So actually, it's going to definitely be Thursday. I thought it might be later today. But, um, but we, we can actually compare a price-to-earnings ratio val- and valuation to something like that dividend discount model. We can put those two ideas together and that will allow us to think about what makes the PE go up or down. Uh, Is a higher growth rate create a higher PE or does it create a lower PE? Is a higher K create a higher PE or a lower PE? So we need to know what moves these ratios. Uh, We also um, need to know the distribution of what the multiples are, you know, what's the high and the low? And and what's it look like? What's the average? What's the median? That sort of thing. And then, uh, as I already mentioned, the, the you know, the, um, the consistency here, price over EPS, both go to equity stakeholders. Whereas if I've got price over EBIT or EBITDA, price is still that equity piece, but EBIT goes to both equity and debt. So that's what I would call an inconsistent ratio. Um, And then we want to ensure that the firms are truly compatible. So back to that house example, you know, are they all three bedroom houses with two baths? And are they all two stories? And do they all have a two car attached garage? Do they all have fireplaces? You know, some of the major features. And if they differ, I've got to make some sort of adjustment for that. And so given time, I think this is a good stopping point. We're going to pick up with this Asweth de Moderin uh, video, the beginning of class on Thursday, and then we'll finish up the relative valuation and then start jumping into um, chapter 19. And uh, I've got some homework problems too that I want to work through with you in class uh, just to kind of solidify your understanding of that stuff. So we'll do that on Thursday. And then remember, we've actually got a final scheduled for, let's see, I believe it's two weeks from today. Or final, what am I saying? Sorry. Uh, I'm running to the end of the semester already. Sorry. Uh, midterm. We have a midterm scheduled for two weeks from today. So hopefully you're already keeping up with the reading and the homework, looks like you all are, but uh, keep that in mind. Kind of uh, think about uh, how are you going to spend the next 14 days to be ready for that. And uh, let me also uh, 
emphasize, you know, if you want to talk about homework questions or questions uh, that relate particularly to your understanding of the material, feel free to email me and we can sit down and set up a, an appointment or just uh, talk during regular office hours. So any other questions before we close up? All right. I will see you all on Thursday. Have a good couple of days. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.